If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, look, we talk all about fitness, health, lifting weights, building muscle, burning body fat, but we also have a lot of fun in the introductory portion of this episode where we talk about current events, our lives, and a lot of other fun stuff. Here's what we talked about in the first 40 minutes, our intro portion of this episode. I talk about my cold avoidance protocol. Uh, My girlfriend has a terrible cold, and Mm. so I sprung into action and and put implemented my cold busting formulas, which included cold busters. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Implemented elderberry zinc lozenges, and I started using Organifi's immunity powder. And guess what? I don't have a cold. Uh, We are sponsored by Organifi. So if you go to Organifi.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump, you'll get 20% off all of their products. Adam then gives us a rundown on how his dogs are reacting to new baby Maximus in the house. Looks like they've all become great friends. They're best buds. I talked about an article on artificial wombs. Apparently in the next 10 years, we're going to be making babies outside of the womb. Uh, I'm what pretty sure there's a, are we doing? Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a few sci-fi movies that uh, talked about the dangers yeah. of that, but whatever. Let's ignore Warning. that. Uh, Justin talked about the 13,000-year-old skeleton that was found in Mexico and how it uh, talked about different species of humans. That's kind of cool. It's crazy. I talked to the, about the movie Rocket Man. Excellent movie. Highly, highly recommend. Uh, there was a study on juice and soda. Apparently drinking a glass of juice or a glass of soda every day, according to this particular study, resulted in an increased risk of cancer. So you won't want to miss that. It's bad for you? Then I talked about testosterone boosters and how researchers went through the top 50 testosterone boosters and found out, guess what? They're all bullshit. Hmm. Uh, And then we get into the fitness portion of this episode. The first fitness question, how do you put maximal load on your muscles and put minimal load on your joints? So how do you work out hard but also save your joints from pain, wear, and tear. The next question, this person wants to know the difference between mobility and priming movements. Are they different? And if so, uh, examples. So we talk all about that in that part of this episode. The next question, what are the benefits of the Turkish getup? There's a lot of people out there that say the Turkish getup is a waste of time. And there's other people who say it's one of the greatest exercises ever invented. We give our input on the Turkish getup in that part of this episode. Somewhere in the middle. And the final question, this person wants to know what we think the next big health fad is going to be. Now, we've been prophets in the past and have predicted things in the past. See if we're accurate again. Listen, and then let's wait and see if it stands the test Hashtag of time. Hashtag Salstradamos. <laughs> That's it. Also, this month, Maps Anywhere, our fitness program that requires no equipment, no gym, all you need is your body and some resistance bands, That program is 50% off. Now, we designed the program to be extremely effective. So we didn't think to ourselves, hey, let's make an easy program for people who don't want to go to the gym. No, we thought to ourselves, sometimes there's hardcore people who want lots of fitness, lots of muscle, fat loss, but they like working out at home or they like working out at the park. We also have people who work out consistently but also travel a lot for work. So we wanted to give them an option. That's what Maps Anywhere is. Uh, that's what Maps Anywhere is, and it's fifty percent off. So here's what you do: go to mapswhite.com, M-A-P-S-W-H-I-T-E dot com, and use the code Anywhere fifty A N Y W H E R E five zero for the discount. Also, I do love to listen to podcasts, and one of the best podcasts that I found on iTunes and other mediums is the Jordan Harbinger podcast. He interviews the best guests, um, and I learn quite a bit from his show every time I listen. And he's here with me right now. Jordan, the episode you just did with Dr. Matt McCarthy blew my mind. Yeah, this guy is an infectious disease specialist. And it's funny because we were supposed to originally do the episode at UCLA where he was lecturing, but we couldn't go there because there's a measles outbreak. Oh, wow. I was like, the irony of this, because my wife's pregnant, so she couldn't go Mm -hmm. near it and she was doing the videography. But this is really fascinating, this guy, because he discusses the overuse of antibiotics, which probably isn't news to people who listen to Mind Pump. But since we're using antibiotics for everything, like even in hand soap, 
we're creating these really resistant strains of, of bacteria that not only can kill people who have immune compromised systems or compromised immune systems, they can kill healthy people. And like, if you get this, basically you have to take this other drug that annihilates your kidneys and your liver in order to get rid of this infection. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And he talks about how uh, we're developing drugs at a glacial pace to combat this because there's no profit in developing new antibiotics. Wow, that was that part scared the hell out of me, but it didn't scare me as much as the the part where he talked about how because of the changing climate, we're thawing out like permafrost and yeah. whatnot, and we're getting like new diseases pop up we haven't yeah. seen for thousands of years. Exactly. So like, <laughs> there's a, a case of anthrax that happened totally naturally in I think northern Russia or Siberia. Because reindeer that, I guess, are immune to anthrax and are just riddled with this are thawing out and they've been dead for, you know, I don't know, 300 years or 200 years, however long. I don't think since an ice age, but they've been frozen for a long ass time. And I said, okay, wait a minute. So if there's stuff like that that's frozen in northern Russia where there's actually people, what's in the bottom of caves? What's in the North Pole glaciers? And he's like, there's there definitely can be stuff. He's like... I don't want to alarm you, but there's a lot of bacteria we've never seen before that we have no natural resistance to because humans maybe didn't even exist when this was like colonizing and is now, you know, four yeah. million years underground. I'm not trying to get the dinosaur flu, so I don't no. know about you. Anyway, Nobody wants that. Anyway, that episode was all awesome. Uh, it's episode 222, Dr. Matt McCarthy. You got to go check this out. It's the Jordan Harbinger podcast. Hey, so I got a, I got an interesting uh, anecdote for you guys. What's up? Ooh. So this never happens. So I don't know what's going on here, but so uh, as you know, Adam, Jessica hasn't been able to come see the baby because she's got a terrible cold, which she never, ever has. This must be like tearing her apart. It's, I know how much she wants to go see. She's him. so upset about it. But anyway, yeah. she never gets a cold. She's not. The, she doesn't get sick often at all. She's got like an immune system of a, a horse. I'm the one. That'll get like if there's a cold anywhere in the vicinity, yeah, I yeah. get it, and then it hits me back, and then you can hear my voice change and everything. I'm sure people have heard episodes where my voice is all weird because I caught the cold. Well, anyway, she has a terrible cold. As soon as she started talking about it, I went into action and started using all the immune boosting stuff that I knew. Right, so I did my elderberry zinc lozenges, mm. and I did the Organifi immunity powder. Ah. Now I do I, I I do the elderberry. Always, if I feel like I'm going to get sick, and I know it does help. It's actually one of the only things proven to help, and it one does the, reduce the severity. One of the greatest hacks you ever gave me. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. But this time I threw in the Organifi uh, immunity, and so normally what'll happen is if someone's sick around me, especially Jessica, because I still kiss her and stuff, so whatever. Normally what'll yeah. happen is I'll still get the cold, but it'll just be milder, and it'll linger a little bit. But I'm not going to get the terrible, you know, part of the cold. You know what happened this time? Nothing. Really? I got nothing. Dude, wow. you, at all. You truly are one of the greatest closers. Did you see what he just did right there, yeah. Justin? What did I do? What did <laughs> he, I do? <laughs> he just justified his fucking weird ass voice and threw a commercial Ooh. at the same fucking time what? right there. Yeah. Did you see that? Did you see what he just He's did? Smooth. Did you see what he just did right no, there? That's why I didn't trust let him me, initially. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah, let me explain. Like I sound like I'm talking through my nose all the time. Oh my and god. And then on top of that, <laughs> I'm gonna throw a commercial for Organifi. And that that Hold was on. that was gold, uh, bro. Hold on. My voice. I am. It is. A, it, is a, it is a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. It is absolute. It's an absolute pleasure. Because you, you know what? You. If I ever feel the sensation like I'm getting a cold, like, yes, that's that's what I'm doing. God damn. Listen to me. <laughs> Listen, Linda. This is my normal voice. You're saying that my normal voice sounds like shit? <laughs> Fuck everybody. Oh, I got to tell you guys this. I can't believe I didn't oh tell you this. Oh, my God. God. So, already, yes. Listen. You're so, going to hurt my feelings. Listen, Linda. I can tell. Okay, no. so. This is going to be a feelings hurt. Uh, we shared, we shared uh, the first time uh, when, the storms when you guys came to the hospital and you saw Max for the first time. Uh, it was Sal got his first real cry out, right? right? So that was really funny, right? We made it. It was a great laugh and shit. This is fucking true story. Swear to God. <laughs> Yesterday. So the episode goes live of uh, me talking about the, the birth and uh, Katrina, Katrina and Cassie, my sister, are at my house. And they, they see it and they hear about it. And they're like, oh, put it on. I want to hear it. And so we put it on the TV. And I'm laying there uh, and actually Maximus is skin to skin and sleeping on my chest. Right, It's like my favorite thing right now. And I'm in the living, and in the living room. We throw it up on the TV and we, we start it. And I kid you not, okay, from a cold, dead sleep, he fucking wakes up crying when Sal's voice comes on in the <laughs> intro. 
And then to be, it gets better. So he's crying, and I'm soothing him. and like, it's okay. It's okay. The Sal's going to stop talking real soon. Uh, <laughs> stop and then I, lie, don't lie to your kid, I, first of all. Because you know I'm not going to stop. The, and, then, uh. and then I come on and start telling the story, and swear to God, it comes right down and start, it goes right back to sleep. Yeah, it was the Sweet, funniest soothing music. shit ever. No, it is true. You, you do tend to put people to sleep wow. on the podcast. Yeah. I, like how, I like how you spun that. That's good. Uh, Damn yeah. it. Yeah. Damn it. Yeah. I do have a piercing voice. Mm. What do you uh. Do about it. I've only been told that five trillion times by everybody. Yeah, the irony is like every like kid in America loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll yeah. see about that. Yeah, it's weird. I'm gonna win them over. Weird. I'll yeah. use candy. Weird that like Adam's I don't give a fuck. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm a briber. I'll, he's may, hey, he's when, definitely my boy. When I, yeah, when I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I see your kid, I'm gonna bring a little lollipop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, butter yeah, him up. Start the, yeah. yeah, start the training. Oh early god, there. I'm not looking forward to when those days start happening. Well, when right? people start bringing him candy, yeah, and shit. it's when family oh. starts. Just, look at his face when you give him ice cream. Like, yeah. no, have yeah, fun with that, yeah, dude. Look at yeah, look at your face when I do to it after you do that. <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> that's so funny. How are the dogs with him? You know what? Um, I didn't even ask you about this. Yeah, I was really, I was really nervous about that because, uh, and I know uh, bulldogs are great with kids. They're, it's they're no, the breed is known to be incredible with children. But my boys are like, they're fuck. And I tell you guys all the time about how they fucking fight like crazy, and they're extremely needy. And they've been our children. So Katrina and I's children for the last you know seven eight years. So you're uh, worried they're going to be jealous? Yeah. Or yeah, so I was more worried about that. And when I first walked in the door, I mean, they were like all over me and wanting to smell him aggressively, and I had to kind of get him to calm down. After the first 24 hours and actually hearing him cry, which is that it was kind of cool when he first started crying was when the boys really changed, their demeanor changed. Like it went from being like this like doll looking thing that I was holding that like almost looked like a toy, and they were like tr aggressively trying to get to it and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. To when he started crying and seeing Katrina kind of like hold him and soothe him, then they were like real docile. Then they came up and they were like really careful. They and, realized, yeah, they, oh, wow. yeah, it was pretty trippy. So, and I, I, uh, I, sh I did a little video clip of. Uh, I have them on uh, this. I forget what they're called. I think it's called a docking thing or whatever. It, it's from Taylor and Rachel bought it for. I got uh, one of those. Yes, it's not that. It's not what you're thinking. <laughs> it's like a, a portable little mini bed for them. That he has, you know, it's got bumpers all the way around, right? So it doesn't roll off your couch or something like that. Really cool little uh, gift. Uh, and anyways, and he's been using it a lot. So I have him on the couch uh, sleeping next to me, and he's making his cute little sounds. You know, when there's some baby sounds when they're like sleeping. Uh, yeah, and, it's all the little grunts. Yeah, <laughs> and and Bentley hears it because Bentley's laying on the on the ground, and he kind of gets up and he walks over and he gets up on the, he puts his paws up on the couch and like gets his face like right into his face. But he's being really gentle, and Bentley's normally really aggressive. Like, you know, if you if you lean down and you ask for kisses from Bentley, he like opens his mouth and like slams his teeth into your face. It's like <laughs> it look people think he's by, going to he bite loves you hard. Yeah, he's just yeah. a he's just a big aggressive dog. And he's the Justin of dogs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, absolutely. Similar. That's yeah. yeah. They definitely yeah. have very similar ah, traits. Yeah. I'm <laughs> yeah. coming in. But he uh, he's already changed the the, the baby. From, once he started to hear the baby cry and make these little noises, now he gets up there and he's like real careful and he's close. And now, small. when you're watching this, because dogs sense energy, also, I would feel conflicted because part of me would see the dog come up and you'd be like on guard, like, what right. if he does something? But you don't want your dog to well, feel you're, that. You're watching like real closely. Yeah, because so, you don't want your dog to feel that energy because it could make him anxious. Yeah. So I know that, and that's and and I know that I'm really comfortable around infants and dogs, and and so I've been the one to do that. I didn't want Katrina because she can get a little anxious. She was anxious with the dog. She still to this day gets anxious when the the dogs start fighting. And I always am trying to remind her like, relax. They're brothers. They're no no. Neither one of them are going to kill each other. The worst is going to happen is one's going to bite the other one and those small blood come out. And mm. but that to her just it's like, oh my, that's crazy that you would allow that to happen. I'm like, ah, eh, it's just different. You know, it's like two boys wrestling in the living room and scruffing and one of them gets cut or scratched. You know, it's not a big deal. So I'm, I've been kind of doing all the introducing the dogs to the, to the baby being there. And, you know, I, I, I stay close, right, just to be safe, but I, I want them to feel that I feel comfortable and okay so with it. So you're just sitting back chill? Yeah. Well, I mean, originally what I would do is I'd, I'd actually, I'd be holding Max and I'd squat down all the way down in our you know, deep squatted position. And, and then I'd keep him held and then I, I would call the boys over and I'd have them sit and I'd pet them and tell them easy and 
let them smell them. Mm-hmm. And as they're smelling them, and at first, the first few times they're smelling them kind of aggressive and like shoving their face in them. And I would kind of push them back easy, easy and tell them easy, just like I would when you're teaching a dog to mouth instead of clamp down. Mm-hmm. Like when dogs are puppies, all intentionally, you, you intentionally shove your fingers in their mouth and stuff like that and allow them to kind of bite on you, but then tell them easy. You know, and let them know to be easy when your your fingers and your hands are in their mouth. So they've already been trained by me on that a long time ago. So same type, they they've heard that from me before of easy, easy, gentle. You know, so uh, when when their their face is close to them. So that's what I've been doing with them, and they and they did. They made the transition way faster than I thought. I was a little nervous because of the jealousy thing going on, um, but they've been great. Although. I'm dealing with something right now with Mozzie that I don't know what's going on with him. He's got something. It's a respiratory issue because I can hear it in his breathing, uh, and he just doesn't even have the energy to. You think maybe he's got an infection? You don't know. Yeah, about? I think he does, and and he's already got lung issues. He's he's the one who you know we almost lost him last year or almost a year ago now, uh, and we had to have him overnight and oxygen and and surgery, and and he barely lived and. Now he's going through something right now, and I'm just like, God, I have enough on my fucking plate right now of right. trying to mm-hmm. juggle. Now my fucking my one of my dogs is is having a hard time. You so. taking him in today? I, yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, as soon as we're done here again, I'm rushing back because uh, Katrina's uh, at, at the pediatrician right now, so she's with uh, with them, so I can get back and and find out what's going on there. Make sure she's getting some rest. She was up a lot last night. Uh, and then make sure that I'm uh, checking up on him. So I'm all over the bo- yeah. all over the board. Well, right you now. know, dogs are they view humans as their part of their pack. So I think if you know if, if it's all done properly, they'll view the baby as like a baby, oh, yeah. part of the pack, like a Adopted puppy. Adopted right away. Yeah. yeah, and dogs are can be incredibly protective over children. Did you guys yep. know what you, you guys obviously know what an American pit bull is, right? Yeah. Uh, Amstaff is another version of a. American pit bull a little bit different. Do you know what they used to be called in, uh, at the turn of the century in the early 1900s? Mm-mm. Nanny dogs. That was actually. Oh the, really? Yeah, oh, the, they would just like like babysit. Them. Well, pit bulls got a bad rap later on. Um, you know, like in the 70s and 80s when they started getting a bad rap because they bred them to fight. Well, they they were bred to fight initially, <laughs> but because then you had gang bangers and thugs and shit using them to fight, and of course people with their you know, insecure, you know, people wanting to have a tough looking dog. And so they, you know, and they treat him shitty and so you'd have a crappy dog. But pit bulls initially were, uh, they were revered. They were nanny dogs. So they were revered for being extremely good with children, very protective. And so what moms would do um, during this time is if, if they had to leave the baby to go do something, which was more commonplace than it is now, we don't really do that anymore, right. but they would leave the dog with the baby and they, she knew nobody would fucking get near the baby because the dog wouldn't let anybody get in. So they called them nanny dogs and they were exceptionally good at watching over children. How, so how I'm cool ex- is that? I'm yeah. actually really excited because I think the boys will be like this. I remember, what were we doing? I'm trying to remember what it was, but the first time that I'd seen this, it's it happened multiple times now, but uh, the first time that I noticed that the boys were like that for Katrina, <clears throat> extremely protective of her. Like you can tell that in the family – that I've asserted myself as the alpha amongst the the two dogs, uh, and myself and the and, and our family, and but uh, and and Katrina is the lover and the and the one that is there to to coddle to love to if they're hurt or injured and so they kind of have that bond and relationship with her, and so anytime that we're out and like another dog or anything like comes they, it's crazy they the way they stand, they mount up like in front of her. It could, it could be me, her, and then and we're walking them. They're not protecting you. Yeah, they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't get in front of me, or or, or don't seem to worry about it. They stance in front of her and kind of and kind of block whatever in between whatever you know That's threat great. is around. So and that goes for other dogs or even like strange people that are walking by. They don't recognize or they look suspicious. The boys get all really. That's uh, great. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. When I was see. a kid, we had a a pit bull. I've always had pit bulls growing up, but. Uh, when I was real young, my dad had a big one, a 95 pounder. And um, my dad used to put me on his back and I'd hold on and he'd walk around real slow so that I wouldn't fall off. So I'd be riding him like a little horse almost, you know, and he'd <laughs> kind of walk around real gentle. And if I fell off, he'd like slowly let me slide off. And he was super good with us. It's really, mm-hmm. really cool. I, I find that stuff fascinating. Speaking of babies, read an article um, uh, about artificial wombs. What? So, yeah. So, um, 
scientists. I got to bring up this 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 article. Let me like read the you Matrix, that. where they put you in a little uh, pod. Here's or what? here's the quote from from the, from scientists while working on this: <clears throat> that we will be growing babies in artificial wombs within a decade. What? Yeah. So within ten years. Dude, that is insane. So doctors at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia are in talks with the uh, with the FDA to begin testing artificial wombs on human embryos within the next two years. And if they're successful, then probably uh, within 10 years. And that's the 10-year plan. The 10-year plan is to be able to have a baby outside of the human. Bro, Dude, audience. from a moral ethical perspective, who's checking them on this? Well, nobody. Bro, uh, how weird nobody. will that be if my girl can give the egg, I can give the sperm, they can artificially create our kid, feed him the most optimal food for nine months in this womb, and then out comes our kid. But yet Katrina doesn't have to carry it. Katrina doesn't have to feed Sounds good, right? Sounds, yes. <clears throat> Too good to be true. Well, Usually uh, is. 100%. It right? sounds great and all that, but this just highlights the... Uh, God, what's the word that I want to use when uh, the... People are, are, they think too much of themselves, not conceited, but- Narcissistic? Uh, uh, not, not narcissism. Uh, God complex, bro. Just yeah. the, the uh, just we have a tendency to um, think that we have, we understand everything. No, we know what we're doing. This is right. great. There's much more- Arrogant. The arrogance. Thank you very much. Yeah. This highlights the biggest problems that humans have always is our arrogance. Humans, yes. are, we have a tendency to be so massively arrogant that we really think that if we solve- the physical problems with having a baby, like, oh, no, it's going to have right. the warmth, the nutrients, it'll have the bacteria, all the stuff. It's going to have all the stuff it needs to grow that, that we've, that, that's everything that the baby needs. Like Sorry. all the materials. <clears throat> yes. But they're not considering so many other factors that they're just still learning about that happen, you know, inside the womb with the mother involved. Look, there's a, there's a, and look, I, I, I you can, you don't need to have a baby to have a tremendous bond with that baby. Obviously, I'm a dad. I'm a, I'm a man. I've never had a baby. And there's people, there's children who've been adopted, and you have incredible bonds with the children. Um, but to say that there's nothing special aside from the fact that you just provide nutrients and a, a home for this fetus or whatever, that there's nothing aside from that is so arrogant, it's insane to me. Yeah. And so the fact that we're going to go ahead and do this, you know, try and do this in 10 years, you know what's going to end up happening is we're going to one or two generations later be Dude, like, oh shit. They're uh, going to be cold and like psychopaths. Me? I don't know. I'm, I'm, that's my prediction. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But it's it's really crazy. To it's, and of course it's going to be popular because you, you know women are going to be like, oh cool, I don't have to. Dude, when you start taking humans out of the equation, it becomes less human. Oh, I, I mean, it's pretty common sense. Oh, I don't my know, mind. man. It's weird. Well, you you got to see where it, it sounds extremely appealing. I mean, it sounds- Of course. To, I could sell the fuck out of it. Yeah. I mean, and trust me, especially after seeing Katrina go through the birthing process. I mean, I think if, I think if most women, if you could say, hey, listen, you can have that exact same kid. Everything's sure. gonna, you, Yeah. Just you ain't got to go through holding him. You can yeah. go through feeding him. You don't have to go through letting him come through. You don't need no your, stretch like marks. Grocery gateway, shopping. No, yeah. 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 Hormone yeah. changes, all that stuff. Yeah, you're, I, I could totally see the appeal, and and you know what's going to end up happening. I'm going to call this right now so that people can look back on this episode from ten years, yeah. and be like, he called time stamp this. I'm going to remember this. Anybody who opposes artificial wombs is going to be labeled anti-feminine, uh, anti-women. Oh well, you know, of course you're going to say that. You don't have the one that has to go through the the all the changes and all that. It's going to be anti, uh, you know, people who can't have kids, for example. Yeah. Right. You know, two men getting married, or right. two, you know, whatever, or or it's going to be anti people who just can't have a kid because of re you know maybe some reproductive issues and all that stuff. I, that's how they're going to label it so that people aren't going to have a opposing opinion. And I, I, I I'm not a hundred percent opposed to it because I can see situations where this may be incredibly valuable. I just think we need to take a step back and slow down. That's really arrogant. You know what I'm saying? Super yeah. arrogant of us to do that. Just because you can doesn't always mean you should. Yeah, who knows? That's the thing. Like, who knows what this is going to look like? Yeah, Fuck, ten years? Yeah, in a decade. Ten years? Yeah, bro, your kid will be ten years old. That's yeah. crazy. And people will be having babies <clears throat> in a bag. I'll be the last, like, yeah, natural stuff. You know, the guy in the world. You cool. know, I just feel it's yeah. crazy because then when you watch something like The Matrix for the first time and you see that, you're like, oh, that's crazy. That'd be weird if it was really like that. It's like, whoa. 
the fact that that could be reality, that we could actually start to have like it's like a factory. You know, you turn into it's almost like a, you watch like cars being built. You know, that's like what like the human experience. Well, is think be about for birth. think about it, uh, God, from a sci-fi like conspiracy theory standpoint. You imagine that like. People like there's some corporation or government. Of course, there's gonna be a corporation that's yeah. gonna make a shit ton of money yeah, they, from this. They have control over all these babies that are growing. Yes, and then, dude. And they're like, okay, what well, we're, we're gonna slightly. No one's gonna know this. But we're gonna slightly yeah, modify. We're gonna program them a little bit, just a yeah, little bit. So when we play a certain type of music, they all become soldiers. Yeah, to, yeah whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 like, come on, you idiots. Of course. Or it could be even more subtle. You guys watch way too much sci-fi, <laughs> dude. They they put it. I'm, I'm telling you, they're throwing all the red flags out there. Like, hey, you might want to consider this. You might want to consider because there are like evil people that still exist that you know are controlling buttons, bro. It could be even more subtle. It could be like they'll slightly tweak him just enough to prefer the toilet paper that we make. You know what I'm saying? Like, we've got all these games. Well, okay, now I can get on board with that because that's if, super subtle, right? Right, yeah. exactly. What we've proven already is it's everything's about money, Subtlety, right? It's, it's yeah. always about that. I, I think there's there's it's more likely instead of someone trying to create you know, soldiers for world domination. Yeah, I go down so, the rabbit hole. That somebody's going like, hey, we could do this and like fucking make another business off of it, and these people will all be guaranteed. Like that's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I well, see that. Well, for sure. I mean, like, the, everybody has the same like foot size, so they have like uniform shoes. Well, it's the same thing it. I feel about <laughs> being spied on on in in Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, all these these things that allow access to all of our personal stuff. It's like I'm not one of those conspiracy people that get freaked out, like, oh my god, they're they're tracking everything, and and they're gonna, they they have this conspiracy of doing something awful to us, or they're they got our. All they want to know is so they can sell me shit. That's what they. Yeah. It's all about money, dude. That's a, they really want to know all the shit I'm doing, not because they give a fuck about what I'm doing all day long, it's because they want to know my buying habits. So yeah, they can that's sell what me that shit. company does. But then when you get an evil government that that gets access to that, it becomes something else. <laughs> oh right. yeah. Whoa. But, but hey, but you know what? It's here's the thing: the se- when you start to separate the baby from the the from the host from the mother. And now it's becoming kind of like a product almost. God, you're already calling it a host. The next, the next, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a sci fi statement right here. Well, totally. <laughs> the next step, which isn't a, a big leap from that point, is to say this is to make this argument Hey, look, we have the science to ensure that your child gets the best of both of your genetics. Yeah. That we're going to take, no, it's still your genes, dad and mom, it's still your guys' genes. But we're going to take oh, we're all gonna of- lead all the shit and we're going to give you all the good stuff. Yeah, we're going to take you all your sperms, we're going to take yeah. all of her eggs or eggs and we're going to look at that and we're going to just Optimize make sure it. that he gets the she he or she whichever you choose by the way. You choose mm-hmm. the, the sex, okay? Mm-hmm. We're going to pick the best of your genes, which means they're more likely to be taller, smarter, better looking, healthier, yeah. and faster. And if you oppose that, what a bad person you are. Why would you yeah. want to have Why a person- would you give be- your kid all these like conditions? Totally. Yeah. Totally. It's the next step. And uh, again, that's just, uh, it's well, a hard argument to fight. This it? is completely the opposite. Like, so being like from the past, uh, I was watching this documentary. It was very fascinating. They just found a 13,000 year old female, like 15 year old female skeleton <laughs> in Mexico in the cenotes. Wow. Uh, and this is a big deal because uh, I believe that it predates uh, what they've found before with humans being here in the in the Americas. And uh, what they've they've concluded from um, because the, the thing was with with the American Indians, like they didn't really they, they weren't able to trace them back to like all the rest of the humans, like the genes were a little different. So I guess there was this landmass. Uh, it, it was in the, the, you know, the Bering Strait. Mm-hmm, it was like mm-hmm. an actual landmass there that was even bigger uh, off of like Russia. And it was like called Beringia, I believe. And so they apparently like, like some tribes like came there earlier, Neanderthal to where they, they created this, this race of people that now they're tracing back that has a lineage from this one skeleton, like proved all this stuff. Wow. What? So it's a completely, is this a new, it's a new race that they've been able to trace back wow. but because of this finding it's so you know really that there were neanderthals there there were like modern humans there were like denisovians or something like that yeah so which, all those like they all mated it, you know and created this race of people like on this mass and then uh, the ice age uh you, you know allowed them to kind of cross over into into this um into, into this continent so much stuff we don't know yeah you know what i mean that's it's all so it proves loud. like like how crazy is this like a lot of people if you test their dna you find neanderthal DNA because we obviously mated with this other species of 
you know, this other type of humans or whatever that was different. But then for whatever reason, they died out. Yeah. Either we killed them all or we just did better than they did or whatever. But we were banging them. You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's crazy because y- y- you know about like in the cenotes there, it's like it's a really vast like system of caves and it's all underwater and everything. And so they're getting further in and they're finding like – all these like cool animals and things they've never found before. And just because, uh, but you know, before that they they speculate that the climate was different. So the, um, basically the, the oceans were, were back further. So it allowed more, more land. And so within the, these are mainly caves before, but now they're flooded. So like, oh, wow. did they, they have to they go underwater in, to find this? Yeah. They had to go way underwater because I guess, I guess back then they they speculate that you had to like, uh, I mean, it was trying to find water was tough, so they would go through these caves to find water, and so they would go way into this cave system and then find water, and so it was dangerous because a lot of predators would den there, and so uh, they, is there they an, is there a, died. Is there a guesstimation on how much how much water we had on Earth back then compared? It to It wasn't then? that we had more. Oh, well, liquid water. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah liquid, because yeah. We, yeah, during the ice age, a lot of it's frozen, and yeah, so it pulled it up. Yeah, so you know when you have like you ever put ice cubes in water, and then yeah. the ice cubes melt, and the water level goes up a little bit. Um, it just takes up more space, but no, that's a good question. I, I, I'm sure we could probably look that up, yeah, that's and that's why with you know what they say, well, if the climate warms, sea levels will rise because you'll start to melt, you know, all the ice or whatever. But you know what's interesting? I just read a, a, along those lines. Did you know that plants are growing at a faster, or are, 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 have been growing at faster and faster rates for the last few decades? Kind of like a side effect of the carbon monoxide we're putting in the air. So because we're burning huh. all these fossil fuels, plants are thriving because that's what they breathe. That's what they eat, right? Yeah. So plants are just flourishing all over the place faster um, it's amazing uh, faster how, and faster. It's amazing how everything just kind of works itself out. It's weird. They're getting yeah. bigger, huh? It's yeah. Yes. It's really, yeah. really weird, right? Yeah. Super, super cool. Anyway, last night uh, I went to the movies. I went back to that that uh, place in, um, where is it? Will, uh, uh, what is it? The Prune oh, Yard? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Where yeah, you Campbell. sit down and you eat uh, dinner there or whatever. Which, by the way, dinner and a movie. Can I just say something right now? I've been doing that. Remember, I told you guys a few podcasts ago that bismuth, which is found in Petto Bismol, helps break down biofilms of bacteria. And I've been doing that and taking antimicrobials because I tend to have bacterial overgrowth in my gut. That's what bothers my gut. And I've kind of figured it out. So I've been taking that, and it's really made my gut super healthy. So, of course, what do I do? I go last night and ate a fucking hot dog. Two things of French fries and, and tacos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Going, yeah. going for it. Which, you know what, though? It didn't bother my gut. But you know what's funny? I tied how I eat so closely to my gut health that when my gut's healthy, it's like there's nothing left. And then I go too far in the other direction. And it reminds me of when people tie their nutrition so hard to having to look a certain way mm-hmm. for like a contest and then going off. So I was really aware of that psychological phenomenon. But anyway, I go to the movies and I watch Rocket Man. You guys need to fucking watch that. Yeah, that was the Ellen John sort of a story, dude. It was yes, it is a musical, uh, but <laughs> I like Elton John's music, though. Bro, Elton John is one of the greatest uh, musicians of all time. I did not know this at the peak of his uh, popularity. Did you guys know that his record sales accounted for five percent of all record sales in the world at Holy one point? Holy shit! Really? That's how much wow. he was selling at one point. He was the richest, wealthiest uh, musician. And performer at one point. I didn't know at that. At like 25 or 26 years old. I didn't know that. Yes. Hey. Wow. 5% of all record sales. He was one of the- In the f- world. In the world. That's crazy. He was one of the first artists to sell out stadiums, pa- like like months in advance, stadiums. Mm-hmm. And he would go out there and perform and was just blues people's minds. But this particular movie was produced by Elton John. So this was actually him- approving of like what was in there or whatever uh-huh. this was done really really well really huh. really well oh, you guys cool. got to watch it it's like yeah. one of those you ever watch movies you get like the chills like several times throughout the movie yeah yeah it was one of those movies oh wow yeah so it was it was it was fucking phenomenal i didn't even know, know that was in theater right now it's yeah. super it got 97 on uh rotten tomatoes oh shit i yeah. still haven't watched the one about queen uh, that was really good oh that's that, really good actually good i thought i thought it was really good i thought rocket man was better believe it oh wow that yeah. good 
I thought it was because I really liked Bohemian Rhapsody. That was really yeah. good. That was uh, we watched that like maybe a month or two ago, and I didn't see it in theater. And I would, I would, I didn't have that much of a desire to watch it. But after watching it, I, I told everybody go watch that. I didn't know, yeah. I didn't know the Queen story. No, I didn't know that uh, Elton John had like suffered a little bit from stage fright and anxiety a little bit. Do you guys know that? Mm -mm. Being, oh, I mean, really? Such an incredible performer, was right? Was that why he put, like, the huge glasses to kind of hide? Uh, like, I know sometimes some people have done that, where they, like, get costumes that are crazy to kind of deflect. Well, so I think it was Jordan Harbinger talked about somebody on his show that said that you can create a persona or something. Right. yes. Or do something, like put a hat on or put glasses on, switch into a different person, and then all of a sudden become... Yeah, Whatever, charismatic. I've heard that from a outgoing. lot of performers. And like we've it met works for them. And we've met YouTube stars like that, right? Like they seem super charismatic and, and uh, outgoing. And then you meet them in person, they're super shy. Michael Jackson, yep. you know, is a, is a famous example of that. You know, super shy, whatever. Get him on stage and whatever. So Elton John, that's not his real name. He changed it to Elton John, and I think that might have been part of his like becoming his persona. His persona. Yeah. But his first big performance in L.A. was at uh, what's it called, the Troubadour? I think it was Troubadour. Yeah, uh -huh. that famous kind of bar or whatever. Yeah. And um, he almost didn't go out. He didn't want to go out, and they had to kind of force him to go out. But yeah. then, as soon as he started playing, he turned into you know Elton John or whatever, and did his thing. So wild. Yeah, man. super super good. Anyway, that's cool. Uh, another study on. Um, did you guys see? Uh, maybe you saw it, Justin. We were getting tagged. The study on soda and juice. Uh, did I see that? I don't know if I read that one. Uh-uh. Drinking a glass of sugary liquid, so whether it's soda or juice, this was that's what was different about this study, is it didn't just say it was soda. They actually also connected it to fruit juice. Mm. Drinking a glass a day, uh, according to the study, and they're going to look deeper into it, um, raised cancer rates uh, by almost twenty percent. Whoa! Yeah, like it was 18 percent. I think. What's the concentration of sugar? Like, what was the amount that the typically a juice or or a, a glass soda of juice is 30, 30 grams of sugar? Uh -huh. man. Wow! Yeah, at yeah. least that's what makes it so. That's what's funny is that we <laughs> we demonize soda. Like we've come that far, right? But then juice is so okay. And I always see like there's these, a lot of people that still think it's a health. Yeah, drink. yeah. No, I see kids all the time sucking down the, all the different fruit juices, and I'm like, man, it's, you may as well give the kid a. If you had him sucking down, if you had a straw and a soda can, people would freak out, right? If you saw a little give kid, give him a juice. Yeah, but no, you give him a juice, and it's totally normal. But it's like they're really not that far off from each other. No, the squee you know, <laughs> being able to fit. I don't know how, however many grapes worth of juice into a small container. That's a lot of fun. You wouldn't eat that many grapes if you were a kid. Yeah. Have you ever, you guys yeah, ever juiced yeah. fruit before, right? Like, have you ever done like a juicer? Yeah, how many oranges does it take to, to make to a make glass? A, to make a glass of like squeezed juice, like you, a whole apple, a, you know, a, a half a pound of grapes. Like, and that makes like, <laughs> yeah. that makes like one little yeah. glass of juice. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Plus all the pulp and everything. That's actually else one of the, when filter. I, the first time I bought one, I think it was a, the Jack, isn't Jack LaLanne have a juicer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought the Jack LaLanne juicer when I was a trainer, like, I don't know, fuck, yeah. 10 plus years I ago. Really I really juicing. And I, yeah, I, I did. I got, I got on this, like, juicing kick for a while, and it blew my mind how much fruit, I, I mean, it was too expensive. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, for me to make a glass of juice, I, I'd have to go through, like, four pieces of full fruit just to make this little glass of juice. I thought, whoa, that's crazy. It'd and, be like eating four pieces of fruit, but it, you minus the fiber, minus yeah, all that Yeah, which stuff. is the most beneficial parts of eating fruit is getting all the fiber, skin, and everything that you're eating when you it's eat. It's so typical, right? We look at something and we think, hmm, let's take out the tastiest part and throw the rest away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 concentrate yeah. the fuck out of yeah. it, right? And yeah. then tell people, sell people that it's, like, mm -hmm. so much better. Now, I would assume that, and I don't know if they did this in the study, I would assume that if they start to do the controls because here's the thing with sugar in the context of a low calorie diet and health it doesn't seem to have tons of negative effects but lots of sugar in the context of eating a lot of calories high inflammatory state then it starts to become a problem and so i would assume that people who drink a glass of juice every day or a soda every day nowadays especially the soda probably not healthy you know what I mean? You're you're not talking about like fitness and health fanatics who are having a glass of oh, right. you know uh, of soda every single day. So, so the a, association of bad patterns and bad habits. It's just like, to go context. With it. yeah. Context matters. You know, like same thing with um, cholesterol. Having uh, eating a lot of cholesterol in the context of having a lot of inflammation 
maybe not a good thing, but in the context of being healthy, you know, we always not a we always talk about that, and I, I I talk a lot about the steps and how little. Maybe Doug, you could look up. Uh, I'm curious over the last like two or three decades uh, if we have averages of what the average human's movement over the last two or three decades and what rate it's decreasing at. Because what we what we move today in comparison to what we did just ten years ago and tw- just in my lifetime I've seen such a crazy difference. So it'd be interesting to see what that looks like over the last thirty to fifty years on how little. It's just we don't have to go physically do the same things that we had to do just a decade mm-hmm. or two ago. It's and you don't think about it because we're we're as busy or busier or should I say distracted mm-hmm. more today than we ever have been. So. The, the human mind doesn't really process like, oh, all of a sudden we're this, we're lazy humans. Yeah. And you're still getting tired because you're so right. exactly. exhausted. exhausted exactly. Exactly. We're still, you're still getting shit done. You know, it's just a lot of it's done virtually. It's done sitting down. It's done through a computer. And so it's interesting to, to speculate on, man, are, will we keep continuing going down this path? And can we look back over the last 30, 50 years and see, has there been a consistent decline in movement Mm -hmm. and based off of that where will we be in another 10 years Yeah, i bet you if if for every great breakthrough um in in technology you see a dramatic decline like the like the automobile was invented decline in activity uh you know the uh, the television was invented and its adoption you know started across america boom decline in activity um and then you know now computers technology phones that kind of stuff it probably continues to go down we're, we're going to be like wally you know yeah. where we're all floating around and yeah whatever rascal scooters yeah. another another good article that i read that i wanted to bring up uh there was a study done on testosterone boosters uh which was pretty cool so here's what here's what's cool about the study so rather than taking a specific herb or plant to test whether or not it raises testosterone or not <clears throat> what researchers did is they emulated a typical person searching for a testosterone booster booster online. So they Googled testosterone booster, and then they analyzed the top 50 supplements that came up. And here's what they found. Less than a quarter, I think it was something like 15% of the testosterone supplements had any data at all that supported their claims. So the vast majority of testosterone boosters had zero data to support any of their claims about raising testosterone. Some of them contained doses of vitamins and minerals that were even higher than the tolerable limit. So some of them, they're like, yeah, you shouldn't be taking these. 10% of the supplements included ingredients with data, real data, that suggests that there's a negative effect on testosterone. (laughs) Go figure. How funny is that? (laughs) So at the end of the study, they're like, yeah, testosterone boosters, big waste of money. One of the biggest wastes of money you can find when it comes well, to well especially oh, when you especially when you're somebody cuz that's the thing that I didn't get as a kid cuz again I got I we I was marketed too well just like I know you guys were I took all those you know test one you know over the counter it's been during the ages your testosterone's like you, the that's what i'm saying know, like yeah. when it's at its peak anyways like it, you know, it, even if i did get a hold of one that might actually help a little bit it wouldn't help me at 17 to 20 years 25 years <laughs> old you know it would probably help somebody who's 55 to 60 and you give them and they might feel a little bit of a difference from it so it's funny that's why when we saw when i was talking about you know you know homeboy the other day that posted all his his supplements that he was taking and, and the testosterone booster one had to have been like the most comical. It's like, yeah. bro, you're taking, yeah, you're taking you know, a why? gram of testosterone synthetically, dude. <laughs> your testosterone boosters are not doing anything for you. So in funny. fact, they might be like, like you your, to your point, it, what you yeah. said, it might be fucking hindering Dust. it. <laughs> totally. There is one, uh, now of course, some <clears throat> testosterone boosters have been shown to work on men with low testosterone. It's a different category. Right. So if you have average testosterone, probably not going to help you. Ashwagandha is one of the only supplements, though, that may actually sh- temporarily raise testosterone in men uh, who are even healthy. Really? Um, yeah, and I think, uh, I'm not quite sure how it works. I've been doing a lot of reading on it, but that might be the one that's got, right now, the most promise based on data. But even then, here's the thing. like, You boost your testosterone 15%, Probably not going to notice anything. Mm. You know, sounds like a lot, fifteen percent, but it's it's not. You might not. Notice I mean, much. I th- I think that those type of numbers could be affected as much or more by a good night's rest. 
M- more. Right. Oh like, my gosh. That, I mean, so you're you're thinking about people are out there searching and and researching all the the greatest testosterone booster yeah. that you could take over the counter. You mean, rub this deer piss on. Meanwhile, <laughs> you know, how many people do you guys know other than probably people that listen to Mind Pump, but how many people do you know that actually put a practice in every night to make sure that they they enhance their sleep? Like and that's free. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you don't yeah. got to pay anything, you don't got to take anything. You know, maybe instead of that's Being on cool, your though. staring at your phone in your bed till midnight and then trying to roll over and, and fall that will raise your big time, raise your testosterone, right? Right, big time. right. Make maybe just put a little effort into hey, let's try this for one month. I'm going to discipline myself to go to bed at the same time, to you know, maybe shut down my eating two hours before I even go to bed, pay attention to the light, pay attention to my phone. Like, try doing that and see if you notice a difference. Yeah, I, I, I you know, when I would train clients every once in a while, I'd have a, a, a male client that would come in and you know, when you talk to your client, you do the first initial assessment and you ask them, you know, have you been to a doctor or whatever? And every once in a while I get a, a guy who'd be like, yeah, I just had a physical. And so I'd ask them, if you don't mind, would you mind if we looked at your, if I looked at some of the, you know, your blood markers or whatever. And I had, I've had probably in my whole career, I don't know, around 10 uh, male clients who would get their testosterone levels checked and then they check their testosterone again a year later or six months later. Mm-hmm. And it was not uncommon to see testosterone levels sometimes double in these men. And all we did was start lifting weights, change our diet, Eat get, better. and yep. get better sleep. sleep. That's it. And these guys would go from having testosterone levels that were in the lower range to the higher range. Yeah. And it was like clockwork Just every being time. dialed in. You That's know, it. You got all those factors working for you instead of against you. That's right. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I. Dot com and use a coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. First question is from Dan R. Lang. How do you put maximum load on the muscles and minimum load on the joints when exercising? Resistance training as an example. Oh, cool question, actually. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a cool question. Yeah. I, you know you know who's really good at this? Um, if you want to watch lifters who, are, who really make a, a lot of effort, not always, but the good ones, um, bodybuilders. bodybuilders. Ben yeah. Pekulski. Yeah, yeah. I was this thinking is, Ben Pack. This is what Ben is like. This is what he's known for. Man. Totally. Getting yeah. the squeeze. Yeah, you know, I noticed this myself. So um, like over the last couple of weeks, one of my favorite ways to lift weights is to lift really heavy and to go with low reps, usually around five repetitions. I just respond well to it. I love it. It's fun. It's my favorite way to work out. But I also notice as I've gotten older, I can't stay in that phase quite as long as I used to. And what I start to notice is the my the insertions of my muscles start to get really sore. Um, and then my joints start to get a little bit stiff uh, and achy. And so I would say the the best way to avoid joint pain and maximal uh, and then maximum maximize load load on the muscles would be the opposite of that. To go lighter yeah. but to concentrate on your form and technique and to make the muscle do more of the work. That's going to keep your joints healthier and still give you that hypertrophy effect on muscle. A, ge- a generic answer would be to ch- really, truly try and run a, a program or run a, a phase of training where you are truly sticking to a like 4 two, two type of protocol. I mean, I... Explain I, that for people who might not know so, what that means. And and I and I like to talk about this when I when I used to train clients. Uh, it used to be one of my favorite things to to teach someone right away because I remember when I first started doing all uh, my reading on like okay building muscle and the and the the best uh, the best rep range the best tempos and where you should kind of be at and like you know we we know now that you know that the most ideal way to build muscle and we've talked about this before in a in a short controlled you know six week. Uh, you study would be like, okay, following a hypertrophy type of protocol and a hypertrophy protocol would be that eight to 12 rep range and following like a four, two, two tempo, which is, you know, taking uh, the negative for four seconds. So lowering the weight down, whatever exercise you're doing uh, for four seconds, then a two second pause, an isolation pause at the bottom of the rep, and then a two second 
uh, positive. So as you push up or stand up or whatever movement that we're doing. And I remember learning that. And then I remember like going to the gym and actually like kind of counting in my head yeah. and following that and going like, whoa, I've never felt like an eternity. Yeah, yeah. It feels way long. And then you look around the gym just for a minute and look at all the people that are lifting around you and just for, for shits and giggles, do this. Just kind of watch everybody's negative and count and and tell me how many people you actually spot that do a true four second negative. It's rare. The, the yeah. most common is like two, maybe three. Some somebody who's training. If you saw someone training slow, it's probably three seconds. It requires way more patience. Yes, and it it requires that you lighten the load. Yeah, yeah. Th and that's just that's why you don't see it very often is because. We all ego lift. All yeah. of us do, yeah. men and women. Women are less likely, so I can I see this better with some of my 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 female clients. I was able to teach this to my women because my women aren't as would would not be as uh, cut They're up. more receptive. To well, they don't give yeah. a shit if if I tell them I hand them five pound dumbbells. Yeah. They don't give a shit if that right. I put you know a thirty you know no weight on the bar. Yeah, but and a we, guy is like, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Try nope. taking a teenage boy or a grown man and saying grabbing handing him 10 pound dumbbells and telling him to slow down his curling process like yeah, yeah. you know what i'm saying he doesn't want to look like so guys are harder to teach us but the thing is we'll probably benefit the most oh you get the this. benefits of really emphasizing that eccentric contraction which you know like it, that in itself is like such a uh an impactful focus if you can if you can get somebody to kind of like work on training just like uh, controlling that process better in the eccentric part of the lift uh, you know, you get massive benefit. Plus, it breaks down the muscle quite a bit. Not to mention, there's nothing that is, that's where studies say is most optimal. There's nothing that says you can't do a five second negative. Like, you really want to. So, I used to train clients to go, I would be slower, slower, slow. I mean, I would be constantly telling them to go slower and slower because what that does for me, too, as a trainer, is one, I can lighten the loads. So there's less risk there. Two, I can really make adjustments to their body positioning as they're going through a rep when I'm asking them to really slow it down for four or five seconds on a negative. So, and then talk about keeping the the load and the stress off the joints and able to keep the tension in the muscle. That's This is one of the best ways that you can do that is to, to really discipline yourself to slow down. Another good point, the time under tension, which is something I know a lot of uh, bodybuilders highlight more so than, you know, your strength athletes. It's like, you know, it does provide that when you slow down the tempo, you can really focus on like really contracting and, and, and irradiating this contraction throughout your body and, and maximizing that squeeze of the muscle that that, that time length, uh, you know, increases when you focus on. That. Well, especially when you're somebody who is trying to sculpt the body, which I would say is probably, I don't know, what'd you guys guess? 80 percent of the people inside the gym. It, it's, 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 it's most a, people. It, it, most people. Most people go to the gym because they want to change the way they look or improve the way they look somehow. So if you're somebody right. who is chasing a aesthetics like this is extremely important like you know you have more yeah. longevity training this well i sure. used to I, I used to love being the guy who was super ripped and jacked in the gym and then i would be lifting next to some got meathead guy that was ripping heavyweight and i'd be doing real lightweight yeah. right next to him but controlled and like perfect form that's me ever since instagram <laughs> <laughs> i used to think i was strong and then you start looking around and like okay that's right well I give up the, i'm going to hypertrophy the, now. the joke that i used to say and, and my trainers they would tease me and stuff like that i was like ah oh, man i'm all show no go i just want to look fast when i take my shirt off i don't need to perform at that level Level, you know, I don't need to be the, the baddest dude in the gym lifting the most weight. Yeah. And I tell you what, I mean, that's when I felt the best. No aches and pains. I didn't really start to get a lot of aches and pains in my joint until I started really stretching the limits as far as how heavy I was lifting. Now, mind you, I also gained some of the most muscle during those times of lifting the the one to three or even five rep range, really low rep range, and going for maximal load, I definitely put on a lot, packed on muscle. But I felt the best when I was training like slow, yeah. controlled tempo and eight to twelve. And rep there's range. another part here too that I think we should cover, which is you know, are you is are your joints moving in the optimal way? Um, because you can go four two two tempo, but if you have poor mobility, right. if the leg the ligaments of your joints are supporting you rather than your muscle, if you're moving in a way that's not optimal, uh, lightweight, low resistance can still cause lots of problems in your joints. You know, if you're if your knees are to exaggerate, if they're caving in as you're doing a squat, uh, there's gonna be a lot of tension being placed on the the inside of the knee on the ligaments that keep your knee from folding in half sideways 
And so you could go body weight squats. You could do body weight squats and do them slow and do all that stuff. But just because you have poor mobility, you can find that your joints start to bother you. Um, and so, the, and this is something you should focus on if you are a strength athlete. Like if you're somebody who's like, look, I, I train heavy because I compete or maybe you just love it so much, you want to do it as long as possible. You want to make sure that you're moving optimally um, and moving well because then you have much longer shelf life. Then you can handle heavy weights for longer and longer periods of time because you're just moving really, really, really well. I mean, part of the reason why my joints will start to bother me now, yes, I'm using heavy weight, but I'm sure that I'm not perfect. I'm mm. sure my form isn't absolutely perfect. Well, this is, if it was, it probably wouldn't bother me. This is what happens when you do – That's yeah. the, that is the drawback of training for maximal load, right, and training for strength is – it, it's a new adaptation. I'm not trying to f- isolate a muscle and develop a muscle. I'm trying to get the most weight up, which has incredible benefits, especially when we talk about c- central nervous system, like mm. incredible. But the the desired outcome is different. It's how much can I get my entire body to work together to get this load up off the ground versus training more hypertrophy or bodybuilder-like, which is how I like to train for majority of my career, which is when I do this exercise – I care less about how much I'm getting off the ground. I want to feel it right here. And so I'm controlled and focused in an area. And the the benefits of that is it tends to take a lot of, of the load and stress off of all my joints and ligaments and focused it right on the muscle. Well, if you're not moving well, let's say you're let's say a hundred percent represents excellent, perfect, optimized joint movement. And let's say you're moving at ninety seven percent. So just three percent off. You're at ninety seven percent. Will squatting 300 pounds be worse for you than squatting 100 pounds? Yeah. yeah. That 3% off yeah. means a lot more when you're not it, moving. It, yeah, it exponentially intensifies. Ex- well, you, exponentially. A, gr- a good example that we used to do with this is like take like a, you know, like a 50 pound dumbbell and hold it into your stomach and stand up tall and straight and then slightly just kind of stand with bad posture just a little bit and then yeah. extend the weight out by four inches yeah. from you and notice the stress sure. you right away feel on your low back versus when it's in close tight to you and standing upright just be off your posture oh, the slightest shift slightest you know, bit you get that like deadlifting for me like i was like oh my god just barely even shifted left to right, it, right. Was, it was a done deal right next question from rebecca eight mobility and priming movement seem pretty similar what are the differences between them, if any? Great Ooh, question. question. So mobility, think of mobility as a, an umbrella term that covers, uh, there's a lot of things that can contribute to mobility. So mobility is the ultimate uh, optimum thing that you're looking for. And what mobility basically means is your ability to move through full ranges of motion with total control. That's all it is. So I'm able to express my knee joint from full extension to full flexion with good control, good strength, good stability. I'm able to Mm. flex and extend and rotate my spine with good control, good strength, and And, good stability. And pain-free. And pain-free. That's what mobility is. Um, There's nothing passive about it. Now, what contributes to improved mobility? Oh, gosh. uh, I can improve my flexibility, and that might help my mobility if that's a limiting factor. I can improve my strength and that'll improve my mobility oftentimes. So many times people think getting stronger doesn't improve mobility. That's complete bullshit. If you get strong properly, you'll definitely get more mobile as a result. Um, it, my connection, my ability to connect to certain things, my movement patterns that are unconscious, like all these things contribute to mobility. Now, when we talk about priming, we're talking specifically about doing particular movements before you do other movements to make you move better and perform better. That's what it literally means. So if I'm going to go do a sprint um, and I know my body, the, there may be certain priming movements that I can do that are going to make me sprint better, faster, and safer. Mm-hmm. Okay, if that, if that makes any sense. So it's almost like I'm, I'm trying to create a, or, or reinforce a better movement pattern before I go do this, right. this tough exertion. What's the, the most optimal sequence you know, in that movement that's going to aid in better performance? And it, sometimes you know a limiting factor going in um, you know, to especially one of these compound lifts where you know that your knees are going to like cave in. 
and that's something that you want to address in your priming session to, um, you know, get other muscles to fire to stabilize, you know, your hips better, to stabilize your knees, to stabilize your your ankles. So you think about these things ahead of time uh, with that mentality of what's gonna what's gonna keep my body supported, my joints supported in the most optimal way. Right, and and you know the thing about mobility that's really interesting is that it requires a balance of a lot of different things. So I'll give you an example. So uh, when I say, you know, I'm going to make you more flexible, most people would, would hear that and think, oh, that's going to improve my mobility. Not really, not necessarily. If I had somebody that was uh, that hype, had hyper flexibility and was weak, and I've had clients like this, it's not common, um, but, they, but they do exist. I've had one person in particular I can think about. It's more common than you think. I almost, almost everybody that I've trained that were, which have, I'm sure you guys have trained the same thing, that were like your hardcore yogis that have never strength trained but then want to get into strength training, that they, their whole life they're like, all I've really done is yoga. That's yoga's been my- Or dancers. My, yeah, the yoga, yeah, exactly. Somebody mm-hmm. like a gymnast who that's all they've done like that where they've all didn't dance. Not gymnasts, not so much. Gymnasts but like, do a lot of strength stuff. Right, but yeah, sometimes more, you'll get dancers who- are hyper flexible in certain right. directions. I had one lady that came in yeah. who was just her her joints were just lax. Like she would fold right in half to do a hamstring. She could sit in the splits. She'd sit in 90 90, could fold back, fold forward, but she had no strength. And as a result of that, her joints had all this crazy loose range of motion without lots of strength supporting it. And if I didn't know any better, and I th- and she says to me, oh, my hips hurt. I might be like, well, we need to stretch. Let's yeah, stretch your hips yeah, out. Yeah. And she's like, well, I'm really flexible. That's okay. Increase She's the flexibility. Not what she needs. Well, you know what they would, would far worse. You know what they would look like. They would look like the same thing that when I have taken like a long break off of uh, exercising, and then I go back. You guys ever notice like when you do like the bench press for the first time and you haven't done it in a long time and your arms Shakes. are shaking. Yeah. It and feels like they're laughing. Yeah, and it's not a weight <laughs> that you can't lift. It's definitely a weight that you're you're strong enough to lift it, but then you're you're shaking all over the place. That's because they haven't they haven't cha- trained their central nervous system to carry load through that that range of motion that they have created through stretching. That makes them weak and unstable. Mm-hmm. So you take someone that's super flexible like that, you add a little bit of a load to that person who's never trained their body to carry load mm-hmm. through that except for their body weight, and you add load to that, and yeah, injury could, and, can and, occur. And the reason why I'm communicating this is so that people understand what mobility means because I think a lot of people will see someone who's hyper-flexible yeah, and say they're mobile. with poor strength and say that they have a lot of great – they have lots and lots of mobility. Mm-hmm. No, mobility – think of it this way. The, the word mobile, move, you're moving. So your ability to move – through full ranges of motion with total control, without pain, without risk of injury, that's what mobility is. Someone with tons and tons of flexibility without strength is not mobile. They're just flexible. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it's important to understand that it's this umbrella term. What about if I took somebody who had lots and lots and lots of strength, but terrible range of motion? Increasing their strength further would decrease their mobility. Yeah. It would actually cause it could potentially cause more problems like putting a bigger engine on a car that is a little well, bit re- not stable. Yeah, and I just look at like especially with priming in, in terms of like being able to create and internalize uh, that support system. So I have to create, you know, a tensity with my muscles, you know, going through that that movement. And so that way now I'm basically mimicking that movement, but I'm I'm, I'm creating the amount of force it's going to take to be able to, you know, uh, safely and controllably, you know, handle this load that I'm about to do. And so it's like I'm 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 prepping my mind. My mind is also like prepping my muscles, it's prepping my joints is prepping you know ligaments like everything is is active uh, through that uh, movement you guys ever watch um singers before they go out on stage and sing when they're in the back you ever seen videos of them doing like all their sound stuff yeah mm-hmm. where they're doing the like, I-O, yeah, and they're yeah. moving their mouth around and, yeah okay, that, all, the, all the muscles primed that's and that's ma- an example of priming right yeah. Yeah. It, and, and priming is training your mind um, as as much it's more. It's actually training your mind more than it's training your muscles. It's teaching you. It's getting you set up to move and do things uh, in the right way. That's why you don't want to go right into something cold. That's why warming up has always had value. It's because without people realizing it, they're warming up. They're doing some level of priming. Right. Now here's the thing with priming: you can make it very specific to yourself, which then makes it 
Even far, more effective. Far more effective. Like I could take a singer and just have them stretch their mouth out. Pro- <laughs> that'll be better than doing nothing. But they have specific exercises that they've identified for themselves that are going to make them enunci- enunciate and, and project their voices you know, better than if they went in cold and it was specific to them. Same thing with your own body. It's, Maps Prime does this. Maps Prime has got a test in there that you take. And then you can identify for your own body what would be a good priming sequence before you work out based on the way you move. And then what ends up happening is when you do proper priming, you temporarily dr- increase your mobility. Mm-hmm. Now, this is not a, you know, I know I said temporarily, so people are like, well, what's the use? Well, here's the use. If I can temporarily improve your mobility before you work out, then when you work out, guess what you're doing? You're strengthening better mobility. Now that temporary mobility is more likely to become permanent mobility. This is the value in priming. Priming gets you to move better so that when you work out, that workout is far more effective. So priming contributes to mobility, but mobility is the umbrella term, and there's lots of things you can do to improve your mobility. Next question is from Dad Bod Roll. <laughs> Yeah. What are the benefits of the Turkish getup, and where can they be plugged in to a program? Mm. Remember when we, uh, we Jordan, we Jordan Shallow, Jordan, my boy, he <laughs> always talks shit. I love it, dude. Talk he shits on like some yeah. things yeah. that's funny. I love the Turkish getup. Yeah. yeah, there's there's not a lot of uh, single moves that just really turn on the whole body. Yeah, turn on uh, turn on all the things that are just so like just. This, don't get me wrong. Squat is king, right? We talk about the the squat is king for for a lot of reasons when it comes to uh, CNS, uh, overall muscle building, one of the most functional movements you can do. But I don't know, man. The, the Turkish get up when you talk about the uh, you know anti rotation, you have rotational movements in there, anti rotational stuff in there. There's you move in different planes while you do it. You get some of the same benefits that you would get from a squatted position, squatting like. So unilateral stuff. I mean, there's so many things oh, dude, in that movement. I think it's the movement itself is all about intention and it brings you back to that mentality going into exercises in general because uh, the value of it is it's it's learning, uh, you know, where you are in space. It's that proprioceptive ability to, um, you know, react but also control your body through each in- incremental part of that movement. And it's a complex movement. It's something that you really have to to value as I am I am trying to to really go through this slowly and understand uh, you know all the compensations and things that are that you have to fight mm. uh, through that process and I think it's just it's a good it, it's a good way to reconnect to your body and teach your body and command your body. Now to that point, Justin and we did a really good. Uh, well, we weren't very good back then, but we did no, a we the, but <laughs> the, we did a Turkish get up video a long I was time ago. Pizza, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, on the YouTube. But it's a good. It is good uh, though. What you did a really good job of uh, breaking down the each segment of the Turkish get up, and so I think it's important that you understand. Just doing, uh, it's just like a, a, per, a person who squats with r- incredible mechanics versus somebody who just squats and it's they're all over. Yeah, you got to do it right. You got to do it right to get these crazy benefits we're talking about. So just to, oh, I'm, the guys from Mind Pump say Turkish get ups are amazing for me. I'm going to start doing them, and then you do them and you do them kind of half ass, or you don't even realize that you're doing them half ass. You're just getting through them and you're just progressing weight. Then, then you it loses a lot of its value. But if you can segment the movement, and in the YouTube video, Justin does a good job of breaking i want to say it's like eight parts right Mm -hmm. was it eight at least yeah yeah it's like eight parts for the entire full movement and so if you break it up in those eight parts and make sure that you are 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 taking those eight parts through its fullest most controlled range of motion and and practicing that man the benefits and carryover of getting really good at turkish get up is is amazing and so i know we're selling it right now we're not talking about what the person's asking on how to program it yeah well okay so well that's the benefits of it and you know People who think, who say a Turkish getup is useless or worthless or stupid, um, and you know, and some of these people are good friends of ours, and I respect very much. Like Jordan Shallow, I think he's one of the smartest people in fitness, and I think he's, his integrity is unparalleled. But I will say this: it does highlight uh, uh, again our our own arrogance. Uh, we place so much value on scientific study that we completely devalue. 
uh, that the fact that there are things that existed for long periods of time that people did generation over generation that talked about its value and its importance. And just because we don't have specific studies or EMG measurements showing muscle activation or the fact that it doesn't develop a particular muscle that's aesthetic, we tr try to toss it out. Here's the reality. Turkish getup is one of the oldest exercises we have on record. It just is. It's, there's very few actual exercises that we have on record. Very, very few. Um, running is one of the first ones, obviously. Humans have run for a very, very, very long time. Right. But there's like Hindu squats and push-ups. Bent push -ups. press was one of them? Bent press is yeah. an old one. Turkish getup is old as fuck. You know, wrestlers really uh, 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 in the Middle East did Turkish get-ups as part of their routine. And it was, people did them for generation over generation. Here's the thing that we need to understand. The reason why something exists for generations is because people see value in it. Sure, humans get kids stuck in tradition and do things that we think are stupid. But the things that last typically last because there's some value in them. And a Turkish getup is one of those things. It's been around for a long time. We only rediscovered it recently. And it's funny that everybody's like, oh, the new exercise. It's been around forever. Yeah. We rediscovered it, but it was around for a long time. And the reason why it's been around for a long time is it's got real values. And, and here's the thing. Some exercises are excellent at developing specific strength and power. Some exercises are excellent at building particular muscles. Some exercises are excellent at getting your whole body to work together. That's yeah. all they do. That's yeah. what they do, and that's what they do well. And the Turkish getup is not going to build a specific muscle. You're not going to do Turkish getups and then notice, like, my quads got big, my quad, my back oh, got bigger. You're trying to harmonize a bunch of movements into one beautiful pattern. That's it. So, And, and you're, you know what you're doing? You're doing a, fun, a fund, fundamental movement. You're, take, you're going from the floor yeah, and getting up to standing. And it's funny now, uh, you know, now they're saying that one of the, one, a test that can predict mortality better than other, all other tests. You know, like get up off the floor. Yeah. How, how well can you get up off the floor without having to grab onto things? Yeah. So a Turkish getup just turns on the whole body and works the whole body. And it's not going to build tons of muscle in any particular area. And it's not going to make your squat numbers go through the roof or anything like that. But you are going to notice longevity and health benefits. And you will see some carryover to overall performance benefits. Now, as far as, Plugging it into a program, here's where I see the confusion. It's not a body part specific exercise. So if you're doing a body part split, where the fuck do I put it? No. It's not a movement specific, at least not I like it a, for active recovery. Personally. Yeah, it, it doesn't apply to the traditional lifts either. So it's like, do I do it on a squat day? Do it on a deadlift day? But it is a turn on your whole body day uh, 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 You know, in terms of benefits. So I think just do it at the beginning of any workout. Well, right? Just well, do some reps at the beginning of any workout. That or I, So I, to Justin's point, it's kind of active recovery for me. It's like when I'm when I'm not feeling like I want to get after a foundational workday. So if mm -hmm. depending on what program you have, red, green, black, or any of the other ones, I normally put it on either a trigger day, a mobility day, a focus day, and I just add in three to five you know sets of uh, Turkish get ups mm -hmm. because you what you'll notice because you can't load it really really heavy. You won't get super super sore. Now you might the first time you do it because you're going to feel muscles turn on that you probably which is a great sign. You know, if you do get sore from Turkish get-ups, that's a really good sign to do them. Mm -hmm. That means yeah. you woke some shit up that you have not probably turned on in a really long time. But once you've done them for a while, you shouldn't be getting really really sore from them because you can't really load them that heavy to where you're going to get super super sore from it. Yeah, I look at it too like we've programmed like overhead carries and we in things like uh you know suitcase carries and things like that where we're building work capacity so on some level for that but really it's like it's it's that command over your body. So for me I I love it because I, you can go heavy with it and you can kind of make a you know a rigorous exercise out of it but um you know the true value for me is just you know having command over your body being able to you know function at a really high level and um you know perform something uh, look at it as more like this is a skill that I'm sharpening and then that carries over into you know the rest of the exercises that you just maybe have treated with less intention and this brings that all that intention and connection to your body back in. It's, it's a good real general it's not specific uh, ideally you want something specific but it's a real good general pre-workout primer.
Do it. Do f- do three, four reps both sides before you start workout. I don't care what workout you're doing, and then and then go into your workout and see how you feel. Well, you said it really well, Sal. That it's not. I mean, if it only seems confusing if you're somebody who's in a body part split and you're like, okay, what does this replace? Yeah, the shoulders. Is and it's bad. really not a a replacement exercise. It really should complement any workout whatsoever. Whether you and, and it's on a it, functional movement. And on it, yeah, right. And honestly, it it could be at the beginning of your workout to prime your entire body to get ready for a, a great workout it could be the end of your workout it could be on an active recovery day you really can't go wrong programming programming this thing this i like it personally um this is one of those things i told this i taught taylor to do this and he loves to do them now uh because taylor's not really like a bodybuilder guy he's he keeps himself in really good health. He's a big bike guy. Yeah, he's a big bike guy now, right? So he's riding his bike <laughs> yeah. like crazy. Um, but, but, so the guy, he cares about his health and fitness. He just doesn't really give a shit about building muscle like that. Like he's not trying. And so when I taught him the Turkish getup, he's like, oh, this is really cool. And I said, you know what's really cool too, Taylor's? I know you you don't really get into the MAPS anabolic and the MAPS aesthetic where we're sculpting and building this body and you have a full foundational workout. There's nothing wrong. And in fact, there's tons of benefit for you to come to the gym and just do a Turkish do Turkish getups for a half hour. Like literally just mm-hmm. perfect the movement and get good. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah. You want to talk about an exercise that really kind of touches the entire body. And because you're not trying to develop each muscle really, really big, you're going to get great benefit from that. And you will build some muscle mm-hmm. from doing that. Like, so he loves that. I'll catch him all the time in here just doing Turkish get-ups. And I think it's a great uh, tool for somebody who is like that, who's like him. And there's a lot of people I know, you know, sometimes we get caught up on this podcast as speaking to ourselves. You know, I care about, you know, Justin really cares about performance. So does Sal. We care about the way we look. Like, and so we talk to that. There's a lot of yeah. people that just want to be fucking healthy right. and want to feel good. You want if you're if you're listening and you're someone like that, Doing Turkish get-ups by themselves for a half hour is a great workout. Mm-hmm. It's a great single workout, especially if you're taking it like, I'm going to perfect this movement and get really, really good at it. it. I tell you what, you will be sweating your ass off, and you will feel incredible afterwards. The whole body. Whole body. Next question is from Amelia Jude RD. What is the next big health fad that you predict? Oh, I'm sticking to my guns, man. And you're, you know you're what? No protein. And thing? you know what? The evidence is starting to come <laughs> it's in. It's starting to come in already. And huh? I remember I brought this up. This has to be one of our first like 50 episodes. I think we cut. We talked like early on, maybe four years ago. We talked about what we thought was going to be the next big fad, and I said I think it's going to be a low protein fad. And 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 I, I know you in particular, Adam, made fun of me. I did. I and I still. It's I, coming. Well, okay, so here's the deal. I Damn. disagreed hard back then. Now you disagree slightly? Just slightly. <laughs> yeah, <I> disagree, <laughs> Let me tell yes. you why, right? Because it's going to be one of those fads that I'm not a fan of because I think, in my opinion, a, a majority of clients, not c- people that are into working out, people right. that hired me because they needed my help to work out, under-consume protein. But because that's not really who moves the fitness market, the people that move the fitness market are the p- hardcore people that lift and exercise. And where I see your your prediction coming through, and and it's going to be hard to argue and debate you now, is this the hardcore vegan movement and the not eating meat is becoming more and more popular, yep. and we're highlighting all these. I mean, we we just re- recently talked about the Arnold movie that's coming out soon, where it's gonna they're going to be advocating for less. Uh, meat product and protein. So uh, yeah, and, and you're, like you're all, probably going to win this argument uh, for sure, even though I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Like all fads, it's going to be bullshit. So, yeah. uh, that's, so I'm not saying it's a good thing, by the way. It's just like all fads, it's bullshit. But what, here's the thing. There's a big push for plant-based slash vegan. And the argument against that, uh, that particular argument has always been what? Like, not enough protein. Right. Like what does right. meat have... Meat has, by the way, meat has a lot of incredible value in things, and most of it's the nutrients, not the fucking protein. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break something to you right now. If you go vegan and you do it right, the thing you need to worry about is not protein. You might not be getting optimal amounts of protein to build muscle and whatever, but you'll be just fine. You'll get the essential amounts of protein with plants. Yeah, sure. you'll be healthy. It's the nutrients that you need to be careful for. There's a lot of nutrients that are hard to get or that are not necessarily well assimilated by the body that you get through plants that you can only get from animal sources. But that's not the case. The case that they're going to make is that they've always made is you don't get enough protein. So now what they're going to do is they're going to attack protein. They're going to say, no, 
Uh, too much protein is not good for you in the context of inflammation. It can drive cancer. It can do this and that. Low protein is better for longevity. They're going to make all these arguments. And you're going to start to see that protein, just like we did with fat and just like we did with carbs, they're going to start to demonize it again. And I, they're not going to get nearly as far as they did with fats and carbs, but they're going to start to get far. Here's the thing. They got really far demonizing fat. And fat is an essential macronutrient. Right. And I remember people got sick. Some people got sick because they had they avoided fat at all costs. Protein, fuck, they start to demonize that. We're gonna have some 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 big problems. But I can see it's already going that direction. Well, we got it, fucking Arnold doing a documentary. It on makes. It. It, it, I mean, again, when we first started this podcast, I was definitely. In fact, you know, you get, this is now we're now what four plus years into this thing. So when, when I first was debating you on this. We I, we are on the other side of watching the pendulum swing the other way. We are joking about everything's getting proteins being that's added. That's how you know that shit's going to go the other direction, right? And I and that's why that. you're probably fucking right. I just what I'm blown away by is how fast this could potentially be coming because we I just feel like uh, a couple years ago we were starting to see everything being you know protein added to every single thing mm -hmm. and proteins becoming this this magical thing that every every company that's not even related to fitness is starting to add protein to their drinks and their food and shit like that so you know you're probably right and what i what i see from the vegan community starting to push back on all that in addition and the rise of that right now with like what the health and now arnold's thing coming out like you're probably, you know, I'm gonna probably concede this one to you for sure that it's probably gonna be the low protein, protein fasting. We're gonna start to hear how popular. Because here's the case that they're gonna make. I'm gonna call it all out before you guys hear it uh, on other on other platforms or whatever. They're gonna point out to studies that show uh, that high protein diet is bad for cancer. What they're not going to tell you is context fucking matters. Yeah. Uh, where you're getting the protein from? Are you eating too many calories? Are you already unhealthy? In which case, yes. You can feed cancer with amino acids just like you can feed it with sugar, uh, carbohydrates, and even sometimes uh, with fats. But they're going to say that anyway. So that's number. Uh, that's one of the number ones. Uh, number one things they're going to say. Number two, they're going to show studies that show that Americans eat more protein than almost any other country. This is true. The average American eats more protein than the average almost any other uh, country. And then they're going to tie that to our poor health. They're going to say, look. Americans we eat, eat more of everything. Yeah, eat, yeah, thank you, Justin. But they're not going to show you that. What they're going to show is Americans eat more protein than the French, more than Italians, more than the Spanish, more than all these other countries, and yet we have worse health than everybody. And then they're going to try and make that connection. Uh, it's the extra protein. In yeah. reality, we eat more carbs, fats, and proteins than anybody else. I'm trying more. to rack my brain, though. That's nutrition. You know, I, I, I can buy in on that for sure. But I'm, I'm trying to think about, like, the, the latest waves that have come through in terms of like like workouts and popular mm -hmm. you know styles and you know we've we've gone through the hit sort of phase we've gone through CrossFit mm -hmm. we've gone through um, you know some online programs and I, I think that you know on some level like these these in home like apps and and it's going to be you know more of a thing in terms of like having cables available or just everything at the house I'm I'm not too sure it's going to win but I think it's going to be pushed on people a lot. Yeah. Well, if you're going to go that direction, I, I can get on board with that, Justin, because I think I'm going to lose my nutrition bet to Sal. I, I actually think that we are in the middle of watching um, the rise of powerlifting. Mm. I, the way we saw in bodybuilding, mm -hmm. the, way, the way we saw in bodybuilding, the you know men's, uh, fit, men's bikini, I almost called it. Men's, <laughs> men's, a little, little men, slip there. Know, right, yeah. talking shit. <laughs> Fuck, man. Uh, those are your people, dude. Men's physique, your people. you know, women's bikini. Uh, that thing has exploded in the last five to mm -hmm. six years. And that it was a crazy, it, it, that's a crazy fad still going. I mean, that's now the thing. It's become extremely popular uh, for any guy or girl who's getting on social media that's into fitness is like doing their first show and you know posting their their bikini pictures or their men's physique or whatever pictures so i think we've been in the middle and and probably reaching towards the peak of the 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 bodybuilding trend that has really blown up i think we're going to see that in powerlifting which Agree. i think is really cool because yeah. we've talked a lot about the benefits of powerlifting i think uh, at least for me come when i first came into the space 
Uh, you know, I you really looked at powerlifting guys as like the guys with the big beer belly and the you know just they were strong but they didn't look healthy or you didn't want to be and so it, I think it got a real negative. Uh, it, it, I think it, it was negative for a lot of people. You looked at it and you go like, ah, eh, it's not. Well, really and something. they're super aggressive. Those gyms are very like like not inviting you right. know, environments. You know what the irony of that is? They're the friendliest. Yeah, the friendliest yeah, people 100%. ever. Yeah. Powerlifting gyms are uh, all gyms. Most gyms, believe it or not, that the hardcore people in gyms always are trying to be friendly to people and stuff like that. That's what you'll find in gyms. But powerlifting and strength gyms are friendlier than bodybuilder gyms, 100%. Yeah. Oh, I They're think They're the so. friendliest gyms you'll ever be in your life. They might not look like it because there's chalk and fucking rust and yeah. metal playing in the background and people are bleeding because they're lifting so heavy. But you go in there and you're brand new, they will spend their well, time Well, if you. they get the buy-in from women... And like like CrossFit did, it's happening. That's yeah, already happening. It's happening. What I mean, I look it, it look at social media off, right yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. back when I powerlifting, I didn't know any girls right. that powerlifted. Any girls, and I knew a lot of guys that just had no desire to it. Yeah. It was a very small niche, and now you're seeing uh, it's growing for sure. I'm glad and I'm happy about it. Yes. I followed powerlifting for a while, like I followed bodybuilding, and what you saw with powerlifting was it started to increase in popularity. This is in the I want to say in the in the mid to, to late 90s. And then the equipped competition started taking over where g guys were wearing the you suits. Know, squat suits and just all these crazy shit and getting yeah. all these crazy totals. And then they lost popularity because everybody was like, well, that... And then, you know, they had like shallow looking squats and it was all well, kind of... Wasn't that like, uh, you know, with bodybuilding, they got so big and yeah. they got so yes. like yep. steroid. It's where like they brought like the men's physique and it just blew up. That's right. It. And it's so what, what happened with powerlifting is they brought the, the raw category where you just wear a belt and maybe knee wraps. And that really increased its popularity quite a bit. And then here's the other thing. Powerlifting from a... For women... I love it for women. Here's why. Uh, and I love it for men too, but oftentimes women tend to, and this is generally speaking- See the most benefits from it. You, well, in generally speaking, women oftentimes deal with the body images. So do men. But oftentimes when women work out, there's this body image stuff that they have to deal with. And competing in powerlifting is a phenomenal way to take your focus off of your body image mm -hmm. and onto performance. So if you're a woman and you're feeling insecure- about your body and you're working out and you keep looking in the mirror and then my body change, it makes things worse. It can make the body image worse. But if you go to the gym, I did this as a trainer before powerlifting started becoming popular or whatever. This is exactly how I train women with, with body image issues. I'd get them in the gym and I'd power lift them and all we would focus on would be their strength. So their focus would turn from how I look, how I look, how I look to how strong am I? How strong am I? And then the side effect of course was right. they looked better. They built more muscle faster metabolism. And so that's why women are really are, are flocking to powerlifting is they're finding that empowerment from it where they go to the, where it's not about how they look. It's all about how they perform. And that's a breath of fresh air if you're always concerned about how you look. Well, sure. and the trainer hack that you, you're you talking about right now, because I found the same thing too, is you what you realize is when you get them focused on that, not only do you help them with body image stuff, but then you also end up increasing their metabolism like crazy, which oh, only yeah. ends up helping when you go back to sculpting. sculpting. Great carryover. Yeah, yeah. When you get back to Yeah. When you get to a client and you get them to stop looking on at the mirror and their scale and how, how much they weigh or look, and it's like, let's talk about your squatting and your deadlifting mm -hmm. and how that's increasing. And if you can get them focused on that for months, and then you and convince them that like this is what we're going to do first is just focus on this, and then we're going to get to that ultimate goal of, the bikini body or whatever it is that you want to look, don't worry. I've got that. Just trust me. I'm mm -hmm. going to take you there. You focus them all on the strength area, which ends up happening as a side effect is not, while they're building all this strength, they end up building their metabolism up, which only makes your job as a trainer to reverse them back the other way and shred or lean them out. Yeah. Really. So it's, Oh, no, I agree. I think powerlifting is starting to get really, really popular thanks to the raw lifting movement, thanks to women entering. Anytime women move into a market, that market explodes um, and they and they are moving into powerlifting. And I don't know if you, have you guys ever been to a powerlifting competition yeah. before. Uh -huh. The 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 com camaraderie mm -hmm. and the vibe is amazing. And I think part of the reason why it's amazing at a powerlifting event is because the results are conclusive. Like yeah. you either lifted more than me or you didn't. So you either learn to be humble or nobody wants to fucking talk to you. Whereas when you bodybuild. 
oftentimes it's subject. It's always subjective. Yeah, and so then, there's always arguments and debates. Afterwards. Yeah, who's oh. better? What, when you go out there, like you deadlifted no. 605, I did lift 600 pounds. Congratulations, you're, be- you're better today. We're done. Yeah, yeah. like no <laughs> discussion about it. That's yeah. it. And everybody's super cool, and it's very. Yeah, everybody supportive. wants you to do well. It is. You know, yes, that's yeah. thing too. and it encourages. Here's why I love it with women as well. It encourages women to eat more food. And sometimes that's a yeah. fucking hard, that's a hard thing to tell a woman to do when she wants to lose weight and she comes to the, you know, to hire you as a trainer. But if I get her to focus on her strength, yeah. then getting her to eat more sometimes is a lot easier. So it's a great, now look, if you go to mindpumpfree.com, you can download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Big Daddy at, uh, Adam at Mind Pump Adam. I like that new name. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal, <laughs> and you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.